Chances are you've heard about Docker and containers, how they can seem big and complex at first glance. But the concept behind containers is surprisingly simple and intuitive. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, in a vast digital realm, there was a kingdom ruled by 32-bit computers. They were kind, benevolent rulers. Applications roamed freely in a land called Userland, using the kingdom's resources as they saw fit. At the heart of it all was Linux, the wise ruler of kernel space. Linux controlled the mighty computer that lay beneath, keeping harmony across the realm. But one day, a great challenge arose. AMD and Intel invaded the kingdom with their mighty 64-bit computers. These newcomers were powerful. They could address vast amounts of memory and wielded more than twice the strength of their 32-bit predecessors. These 64-bit machines arrived like a storm, bringing with them a new menace, the accountants. These figures, relentless and demanding, forced Linux to bend to their will. They pushed Linux to harness every ounce of the new hardware's powers, leaving no room for the old ways. The application Applications were confused. They had always relied on Linux to guide them. Some tried to harness the new machine's immense power. Others felt crowded as war applications and their dependencies flooded into user land. But Linux was not defeated. After much thought, a brilliant plan was born. The old user land would become the host. From this host, new user lands would emerge. These new realms were called containers. Containers were special. They were isolated from both the host and each other, but they still talked directly to Linux. This made sure that the applications inside them ran as fast as if they were on the host itself. Linux gave the host the power to control how much each container could consume. No single container would dominate the entire machine. Balance and harmony were restored. Let's dust off the old computer science degree. Let's take a look at Operating Systems 101. We think about this as a stack. At the bottom is the computer hardware. This consists of the CPU, main memory, secondary memory like SD cards and drives. There's also networking hardware, internal devices that are usually present on the board that control I.O. and the various external attached devices like the keyboard, mouse, and cameras. Here, we're most interested in the CPU, main and secondary memory, and networking. On top of the computer hardware sits a software. We call that the operating system. Here, we're talking about a multi-user, multitasking operating system. Linux, Macintosh, Windows, and the like. The operating system consists of two major parts. The kernel is the core of the operating system responsible for managing hardware resources and enabling the execution of applications. Let's break it down. Process management in the kernel oversees the execution of processes by managing scheduling, creation, and termination. You can think of a process as a running program. It also facilitates the communication and synchronization between processes through inter-process communication and signals. Memory management directly manages memory allocation and deallocation. It plays a crucial role in providing memory protection and isolation, which safeguard processes from interfering with each other's memory spaces. The file management system handles data storage, access, and organization on disk. The virtual file system allows seamless support for multiple file systems like ext4 and xfs, enhancing flexibility across different environments. The kernel manages file operations such as creation and deletion efficiently and securely. The buffer cache improves performance by caching frequently accessed data, reducing disk access, and speeding up file system operations. Networking is essential for device communication, with the kernel managing protocols like TCP slash IP and UDP, configuring network interfaces and providing an API through the socket layer for data exchange. Traffic control optimizes data flow and bandwidth allocation for efficient performance. Security in the kernel protects the system from unauthorized access through strict access control policies, user permission management, and fine-grained capabilities. It also provides cryptographic services to secure data through encryption and decryption. These are the main areas we are interested in when talking about containers. There are a great many more areas of interest in the kernel, but we will concentrate on these for now. The other major part of the operating system is user land. You may hear this referred to as user space. Under GNU Linux, user land is called GNU and the kernel is called Linux. User land contains the software we use every day. While the kernel is important for the operation of the machine, it is invisible to the average user. Developers know that there are system calls and libraries to talk to the kernel from user land, where their programs run. There are command line tools which allow users to work through the kernel to access the underlying computer. 
Applications can have their own set of libraries. Things can get a little tangled up in there. One thing to remember is that we think of user land as having a root file system. The root file system is a top level directory. It is the starting point for all file paths and contains all the directories, subdirectories, and files that are essential for the system's operation. The combination of the GNU user land and a Linux kernel is called a distribution. GNU user lands can be specifically tailored for different tasks, resulting in hundreds of different distributions. The main reason for this is so that when you select a distribution to use, other people can tell you, it was a bad choice. With that behind us, we can finally talk about containers. And you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? Around 2005, computer hardware switched from 32 to 64-bit processors. This is the technology change that enabled the modern internet. The switch brought on bigger memory address spaces. On the 32-bit machines, servers were memory bound, as typical web applications can be thought of as giant databases. The old machines could address 4 gigabytes of memory, the new ones 16 exabytes, or about 4 billion times more. The takeaway is that 16 exabytes is more than 4 gigabytes. This time period introduced multiple CPU cores. The drive and network suppliers then had to better their offerings to keep up. You can understand why the accountants got excited. A computer could service many times the number of applications and requests in the same amount of physical space with just a little more power. Fortunately, the software would be easy to modify to take advantage of the new processors. 10 years later. When you receive your software engineering degree, the graduation speech always includes, we don't, we do, don't things do things because, because they are they easy. Are easy. We, do we do things, things because, because we thought they were going, they were going to be easy. easy. And so it was with containers. Let's go over the basic idea. We extend the hardware. Then we'll have to add a few features to our kernel. For user land, we'll add some features and then cleverly rename it host. This is the main user land that the machine uses after it starts up. We will go over all these features in just a moment. From the host user land, a user can then create and run a container. The container is a separate user land isolated from the host and other containers. However, it can interface directly with the kernel. To a user or application running in a container, it appears as if you are on a separate machine with no shared resources. The host can create multiple containers as needed. As part of container management, the host also tears down the container and removes it. Now let's talk about how containers are implemented. We have our kernel running on top of our hardware. Here are the major features that are implemented to support containers in the kernel. A namespace isolates system resources, allowing processes to have their own independent view of resources like process IDs, network interfaces, and file systems. This isolation is essential for creating secure and separate environments, ensuring that processes remain isolated from one another. Control groups, or C groups, are a mechanism that allocates and manages system resources like CPU, memory, and I.O. for processes. They ensure that processes within a container or group receive their designated share of resources, preventing any single process from consuming more than its allocated amount and thereby maintaining system stability. Then there is the union file system, which allows multiple file systems to be layered, where changes are written to an upper layer while preserving the lower read-only layers. This mechanism is essential in containers enabling efficient storage use and the ability to compose container images from a base image with minimal duplication. This is the least intuitive concept to understand about containers. Let's call it an implementation detail. Let's move up to user land. Run C is a low-level container runtime. It adheres to the Open Container Initiative runtime specification, which sets a standard for container operations. The primary function of Run C is to create and run containers by setting up the necessary namespaces for process isolation, configuring C groups to manage resource usage and establishing the root file system that the container will use. Run C interacts directly with the Linux kernel to create these isolated environments. Container D manages container life cycles, handling tasks like starting, stopping, and supervising containers. It pulls container images from repositories to prepare them for use. To execute containers, Container D uses Run C to create the container environments. Finally, we are up at Docker. Docker is a platform that simplifies the creation 
deployment and management of applications by using containerization. It packages applications and their dependencies into lightweight containers that can run consistently across different environments. Docker leverages Containerd to manage the lifecycle of these containers, including tasks like starting, stopping, and supervising them. Containerd is responsible for pulling the necessary images from repositories and uses Run C to actually create and execute the containers. This layered architecture allows Docker to provide a robust and scalable solution for application deployment. The Docker client is how users access all this container goodness. A couple of notes before we go on. First, when you see a library in Linux that ends in D, it indicates that the library is a daemon. You will hear some people pronounce that as daemon. People that would put daemons in their software seems a little bit suspect. I like this comic. It has more than a ring of truth. YouTube videos, like this one, are represented by pamphlets that would be shown further on the left. It's not until you go out and press the keys that you'll have learned anything. Let's go over hypothetical. Let's say you launch a container on a server. You're going to run a website called slightly unattractive doggos.com. People like doggies and you get pretty good web traffic, maybe 100 visitors a day. Then another person launches a container, grandma's cute kittens.com. Almost immediately, they get 1,000 requests per second. And once they get successful, they have a Discord server and databases for comments and so on. After all, that's why the internet was invented. And I guess it could be worse. <laughs> To your surprise, the performance of slightly unattractive doggos does not appear to degrade. Namespaces are isolating you from the evil kitten empire. Control groups ensure that each container receives the allocated amount of CPU, disk, and network resources. It's like you're running in your own little world. A couple of the big takeaways from this. The intuitive view of a container is that it's simply a user land, separated from other user lands and the host on the same machine. The kernel and host work together to make that happen, managing each container and scheduling machine resources. This also solves the it works on my machine problem because each container is a self-contained execution environment. You build a user land to support an application, and the user land is separate from the development environment. Containers are part of the foundation of the internet. We are beginning to see the wave sweep over desktop and embedded machines now. This video just scratches the surface and gives the basic terminology of containers. We'll use this in future videos when we discuss how to actually build and deploy containers using Docker. Thanks for watching.